Hello, dearest friends, and welcome to the second episode of my thoughts on, in, and out of isolation. If you haven't watched the first episode, feel free to do so just to get the overall context, my immediate goals, and much more. If possible, share your impressions either on my website or in the comment section below. I'm truly grateful for your engagement and the time you spend on my channel. In the previous episode, I said a few things about a statement which is on everyone's lips these days. Namely, that the current COVID-19 epidemic, given its planetary dimension and vast implications, is utterly unprecedented in world history. I then promised to dwell mostly on the personal and psychological repercussions of this crisis. In this respect, I suggested that we are now in a better position to evaluate who our real heroes are. Today, however, I would like to dwell on what I consider one of the riskiest repercussions, which is the involuntary isolation we have all been subjected to. Of course, not just ours, but any isolation poses serious problems to everyone, and for many reasons. Some of these reasons are evolutionary in nature, others purely psychological. When living in hunter-gatherer communities, our ancestors needed each other to survive. Therefore, from a purely biological standpoint, we are, and always will be, a social species. Even if we have evolved to the digital Homo sapiens, the need for others is still very strong, if not forever anchored in our unconscious, instinctual nature. This may explain why to this day psychologists insist that, whether or not they are enjoying intimate relationships, human beings need a sense of being part of a larger community than that constituted by the family. Precisely because our reliance on one another is central to who we are, being separated from others as we are today can have debilitating, even devastating consequences. An extended isolation can affect a whole series of vital needs. For instance, the need for self-esteem, the need to decide how to live our lives, and the need to have good relations to our fellow humans. At bottom, any severe separation damages the way in which we derive meaning for ourselves. And it does that also because it is conducive to multiple, grave, and persistent emotional problems. One such problem is generated by the fact that the present isolation is not the result of a personal conscious choice. Rather, our governments forced us to self-isolate, although for very valid reasons. Still, when indefinitely confined within a relatively limited space, we lack the complete control over our freedom of movement. And if this happens with no end in sight, we start questioning our very place in the world. More exactly, we get a glimpse into what life would be like if we did not exist. It's as if we are experiencing death while still alive. The most basic explanation why this should not be taken lightly is that by taking notice of us in any way, others show and remind us that we are alive. In isolation, that reminder vanishes. Instead, a frightful feeling of disappearance can set in and ravage our soul. As the famous American psychologist William James brilliantly put it, no more fiendish punishment could be devised than that one should be turned loose in society and remain absolutely unnoticed by all the members thereof. The second predicament has to do, in my opinion, with the fact that in isolation we tend to be dominated by negative emotions. At best we get bored, a challenge that the youngest have the luxury of confronting. However, most of us worry or even panic about the future, often without respite. That we might exaggerate a bit in this regard is totally irrelevant here. The truth is, we find ourselves in the grip of fear both for ourselves and for our loved ones. This plight is compounded by the difficulty of not being able to get together with friends and relatives. So, in one way or another, we all feel prisoners of our own life. And the realization that we cannot even guess when this will end is not helping at all. Therefore, as a general rule, Whenever we hear that the dangers of the current quarantine are negligible, we should bear in mind warnings like that voiced by the distinguished psychologist Kipling D. Williams. Specifically that an absence of affiliation with others 
produces a host of negative psychological consequences, including depression, anxiety, stress, and physical and mental illness. Now, how do we usually cope with this situation? From what I see, hear, and read, I would say that some of us throw themselves into work in and around the house, cleaning, repairing, renovating, fixing. We feel relieved to be able to de dedicate ourselves to projects that we postponed for so long. Some of us rediscovered the miscellaneous consolations of food and alcohol. Whatever the case, most people, myself included, feel that external things can help us combat the uncertainty and anxiety within and the invisible danger without. Here, I would immediately admit that there's something very understandable about these reactions. Oftentimes, they prove quite effective in overcoming the negative feelings I alluded to above. Nevertheless, none of these solutions is without problems. For one, they do not last very long. There are only that many rooms to clean, garages to tidy up, furniture to move around, cars to detail, lawns to recede, walls to paint. Consequently, the relief offered by the external world, though as I said genuine, is always short-lived. And then we end up exactly where we started, having to face once again our fear, anxiety, frustration, confusion and boredom, but this time without much else to do. On that account, I wonder whether this is all we have at our disposal, whether these are the only real comforts to our profound discomfort. The reason for my question is that, as it happens, isolation has positive effects too. This means that we can look after ourselves in a completely different fashion. In other words, the same isolation that eats away at us may just as well propel us toward self-improvement and, for the luckier amongst us, toward an extraordinary creativity. Knowing that, aside from feeling worried, hurt, or disturbed, we may try to seek ways to derive inspiration from our current confinement. We may try to turn the fact that we have to rely primarily on our minds to stay sane into an occasion for psychological strengthening and, why not, spiritual growth. Please join me in the next video to see one of the several ways in which I believe you could do that.